Okay, welcome to today's program with AAGGKY and the Kentucky Historical Society. Um, this is a partnership. We haven't done a partnership in, in a while, probably a few years. Um, but I would start off, I would like to um, thank Mr. Jerry Bedford for letting us kidnap AAGGKY's monthly programming. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we all got together and kind of just uh, built this program and um, it's been really, it's been really fun. I th I'm hoping you guys will enjoy this. So to begin, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sherry Daniels. I am the head of library and archives here at the Kentucky Historical Society. And I'll be moderating the program today. And we have a wonderful selection of panelists that are really gonna help us dig into researching African-Americans from this time period. Um, so I'm going to start out by, um, I'm gonna start out by introducing our panelists actually, before we go into some housekeeping. Um, I'm going to start with Rachel because Rachel is one of the main reasons that we are here. Rachel has um, produced a wonderful film that you all would have gotten the link to. I am going to put it in the chat window in just a few minutes so that you do in case you missed that somewhere in the email or in the response for registration. You're going to be getting that in just a few minutes. Um, Rachel is a Kentucky composer and pianist who creates music for chamber ensembles, orchestras, films and collabor collaborative live performances. Her work has been performed by ensembles such as the Louisville Orchestra, Kansas City Symphony, Knoxville Symphony, A Far Cry, Long Leash and the Dublin Guitar Quartet. Her recent works include The Way Forth, a lushly orchestrated folk opera and film which retraces generations of Kentucky history through women's voices, released on temporary residence in November, 2019. She has several solo albums and six releases with groundbreaking indie chamber group um, groundbreaking indie chamber group Rachel's on the Chicago label quarter stick records and we also have with us today Dr. Alistine Turley born in Hazard Kentucky prior to becoming an educator and public historian Dr. Turley has worked in law enforcement as a community organizer and was the first African-American administrator for the city of Toledo's first woman mayor Donna Owens also the founding director of the Carter G. Woodson Center for Interracial Education at Berea College. Dr. Turley is a longtime scholar of history, political science, sociology, and anthropology. She obtained a master's degree from Mississippi State University in public policy and from the University of Kentucky in American history, where she remained and graduated with a doctor of philosophy in American history. During that time, she also became the founding director of the Underground Railroad Research Institution Institute at Georgetown College. In 2020, she became the director of the Freedom Stories Project, part of the International Storytelling Center. Dr. Turley is also a board member of the Kentucky Historical Society, which we welcome her this year. And next on our list, we have Denise Payton. Uh, she became involved in genealogy studies and research close to 30 years ago. Her paternal family resided in Western Kentucky from the antebellum period until the Great Migration years. Denise has presented topics on research methodology, cluster and collateral research, female ancestry and African-American genealogy to the Kentucky Genealogical Society, African-American Genealogy Group of Kentucky, Butler County, Kentucky Homecoming Genealogy and Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. She has attended the Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research in Athens, Georgia, the Midwest African-American Genealogy Institute in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and numerous, numerous learning conferences. Denise is currently project manager for the Kentucky African-American Civil War Soldiers Project, which we actually just learned about in um, a session just what, month or two months ago. Um, so that was, uh, that's a really great project that she's got, she's involved with there. And we have Sharon Mitchell, a Berea, Kentucky native with a passion for historical research. Since 2012, um, she served as Berea College Special Collections and Archives as a research services specialist. She's the past president and co-founder of the African-American Genealogy Group of Kentucky. She's on the board of directors for the Madison County Historical Society and the Berea Kentucky Kiwanis Foundation. Contributed, she's contributed to several oral history projects. She continues to link individuals, families, and communities making connections across geographic cultural boundaries. And she's also one of the stars of the film, if you guys have already watched it yet. <laughs> so welcome to our panelists. Um, I'm going to let them talk. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk already, but um, just a little bit of housekeeping to go over. So our first hour or so we're going to take, it's going to be taken up by the panelists. We're going to let them talk, um, meaning everybody in all the attendees will be muted. 
and please place questions that you have in the chat box. Um, we may address some of those during their talk, um, but more than likely we may wait till the very end to bring up some of those questions. Um, we have, let's see, the handout, there is a handout for this session. Um, it's pretty beefy too. We were all kind of talking about that just recently. It's about six pages long. So there's a lot of information on here for you. Um, that will be made available. I will put it in the chat box for you guys to download there to grab that file, but it'll also be put up on the AAGGKY uh, website and the Kentucky Ancestors Facebook group at the end of this program, which is a brand new group, by the way. I encourage you guys to go to go join that. And um, on Thursdays, the, on Thursday, those of you who already registered were sent a private YouTube link uh, to Rachel's film. And those who registered after Thursday should have seen a link in the registration info after submitting. Um, we're hoping most of you viewed that beforehand, but if not, that's okay. Um, that's totally fine. Um, Rachel's gonna be leaving that up through about perhaps Monday, something like that. So be sure to go back this weekend and make sure that you, you go ahead and view that video because after that, the Fraser Museum will be hosting showing of the video uh, Sundays in November at around, uh, Rachel thinks around one o'clock on Sundays. And um, in case you missed the film link, I am gonna go ahead and put that private. It's a private link. Um, you know, please please treat it gently. It's a private link for those who are attending today. I will provide, I will post that link back in the chat so you guys can uh, make sure you, you grab that and, and bookmark it for the weekend. And we decided not to show the film just in Zoom just because for some technical challenges. But anyway, that is pretty much it. We're now gonna dive into the panelists. So Rachel, I actually do wanna start with you because I wanna give you the, in, the opportunity to introduce your film, what you hope to create, um, its overall message, and then give us some insight into the research behind it. Because I know there's a lot of scenes there with you and Sharon in, a, in an archive actually over at Liberty Hall. And, um, you know, in keeping with the theme today, how did you go about researching African-Americans from this period? Great, thank you. Well, it's so great to see everyone and um, know that we're, we're talking with people all over the country. I'm so glad to be here today and love that we have this collaboration together today. Um, so the film is really a result of music that I started writing in 2016. I knew that I wanted to create songs about women from Kentucky history. And I just sort of dove in and I knew that I, I wanted to make a couple of pieces about some of my family members, but I didn't want it to just be about my family. I wanted to really, you know, explore some other stories throughout Kentucky history. So that meant that I needed to really go back to those very early pioneer days. And um, I knew from family lore that I had some um, ancestors that were at both uh, Fort Logan and Fort Boonesboro. And I always wanted to research it a little more. So um, that's what got me on Ancestry. <laughs> and, um, you know, anyone that, that does genealogy research knows that once you dive in that deep pond, you probably won't ever get out. And so the research into my own family genealogy was sort of one thing that started um, this project along. Uh, but as I was researching, uh, one of the women, I, I really was interested in, in exploring whether I could imagine the life of a woman on that frontier, you know, in, the, in 1775, 1776, what would it have been like to live in one of these forts? Um, and I, you know, that's what, what really fascinated me from an artistic standpoint. So I started researching one of the ancestors, Elizabeth Hoy Calloway, that I knew was at Fort Boonesboro. I found a rather recent book by Harry Enoch and Anne Crabb. They're both Winchester residents. Um, and in that book, I learned about Dolly. And the fairly recent research um, into Dolly's life, um, I think that Dolly has been, um, you know, researched and known about for, for quite a long while. Um, it's just that her name wasn't necessarily known um, and a lot of the details of her um, story were not written down. Um, Lyman Draper and others, uh, John Filson in early days had made very passing references to Dolly's son, Frederick. 
there's very, very little research on, um, on Dolly or her son, Frederick. Her son, Frederick, was probably the first child born at Fort Binsboro, and it was apparent that he was mixed race. So the assumption was that likely, um, as was unfortunately way too common, um, the father of Dolly's child was likely her enslaver, and that is Colonel Richard Calloway. So in researching Dolly, um, I knew that, that she was the pioneer woman I wanted to make a song about. So I wrote a song called Dolly for this, what turned out to be album of songs called The Way Forth. So The Way Forth is a sweeping um, look at women's voices through the last 250 years. And that includes Dolly, um, and it includes a story in a song called End of Dominion, which really is the reason that brought Dolly to Kentucky, which was the Daniel Boone expedition of 1775 in March. Um, a land deal had taken place in uh, Watauga in Tennessee that uh, essentially forced the hand of the Cherokee Nation to relinquish 20 million acres of land to this land investment company called the Henderson Company or the Transylvania Company. So two thirds of what we know as Kentucky was achieved in this heist, land heist, uh, which essentially was a forced land deal. Once that was signed, and even before maybe the signatures were on paper, Daniel Boone and a, another 40 or so people were headed up to settle the fort area. So Dolly was in that expedition, and that's a lot of what, if you've already seen the film clip that we shared today, um, you learn a little bit more about the research that I was doing into Dolly's life and also Frederick's life, and then the exciting development of finding um, evidence of her grandson, Henry Hart, who was a violinist and composer who married a pianist. And they had a bunch of girls and they were all trained musically um, and became public, public school educators and musicians. So um, that was one of the incredible delights in all of the years of research into this family is to find out that Dolly's grandson and great grandkids were all musicians. So um, along the way, I know this is a rambling introduction, but if you have seen the film, what you have seen is 30 minutes of what is like a 65 minute bigger film that explores both the songs that I created and the film that we um, uh, shot to interpret the music, but also some interviews and some of the research oriented details that went into um, writing some of the music and some of the text that's the lyrics or just understanding better what is the, the bigger sweep of Kentucky history through these women's eyes and ears and lives. Um, so the segment that we shared for the, today is um, about halfway through the film. So it begins with looking into Dolly's story and her research and then going into the research um, into the, her grandson Henry's family. And then you might've noticed there was a quick pivot to a song called End of Dominion. Um, what I wanted the viewer to experience there is that sort of emotional shift that happens when maybe you're at a museum in person and you're reading the wall and you're reading history and it's very thorough research and sort of plain facts, right? But all of a sudden your heart or your mind is whisked away into imagining that story of that person. And it becomes a much more emotional journey um, so, so the song End of Dominion, I, I followed by this story because um, it's, it's an emotional journey to think about what is the Kentucky history that we have and how complicated it is, how full of violence and, and contradiction and suffering that is, as well as, as all of the stories we might have been more familiar with and, and heard in our education through our families and museums and writings up to today. So a lot of what I was after was finding the stories that hadn't been written about, um, sharing voices of especially women that I, I don't think had, had enough of a voice in the Kentucky history. And Dolly is certainly one of them. I've referred to her as a founding mother. 
you know, we always hear about founding fathers, uh, but she's a founding mother, certainly of Fort Boonesboro. And um, along the way, I, I met Sharon Mitchell at a Descendants Day at Fort Boonesboro. And that was like double doors opening up into the world of not only fellow Kentucky history and genealogy lovers, but uh, descendants of African Americans of the area in Kentucky that I had been researching. And so Sharon and I have gotten to know each other very well. I've joined the AAGGKY and um, I've learned so much about research, especially into this very challenging area. So um, that, not, that is my intro to this piece. Um, and I, I just really wanna thank Sharon again for being game. Um, a couple of years ago, when we first started filming uh, the documentary pieces on Dolly and the Hearts. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm happy to take questions later on when we, when we get to that. That's great. Um, and yeah, I mean, feel free to, you know, I've, I've got a couple of questions, but honestly, you know, if anything strikes you guys while we're, while we're talking about all of this, and you want to add something specific and, and just, you know, go with it. Cause I know, like I said, um, you know, Sharon and, and Rachel together, there, there's that significant part of the, of the film that, that includes all of that. And, um, and especially Liberty Hall. And that was actually one of the, um, we actually had hoped to have um, someone from Liberty Hall on the panel as well. But um, um, could the two of you kind of talk about you know, the research? What is uh, researching over at Liberty Hall? I mean, in the film, you see they have an archive, which is a, a lovely, lovely place. And, um, you know, what kind of things did you find over there? Uh, well, we recently learned that um, the, li the Liberty Hall Library is the largest, isn't it? One of the largest private private libraries in Kentucky. It's and maybe some has some of the oldest materials. Um, the day that Sharon and I were there, and many members of AAGGKY was um, the purpose of that visit field trip was to uh, see the new slavery and kitchen exhibit that had been curated there to really bring more focus to the um, everyday lives of African-Americans that were enslaved at that estate. Um, Dolly's son, Frederick, was one of them. Dolly's uh, grandchildren were born there. Um, Frederick married a woman who was also enslaved by the Brown family. And so I really did get a lot of research um, assistance from Vicki Middlesworth, who uh, used to work at Liberty Hall, and even so recently got a photograph of a, a slave quarters structure that is not any longer there, but um, we we just I just saw it um, in Russ Russ's presentation in the spring. Um, so uh, I can let Sharon talk more about the books in the collection, but I know you, what you see in the film at least was a um, was a drawing of Fort Boonesboro from a book from 1901, I believe. But uh, Sharon, you might be able to remember more about what's in that collection. Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember as much about the collection that way, except for it, it was extensive and that I wanted to spend another whole day there uh, mm -hmm. but because of the original records. And what I was interested in was uh, several years ago, Dr. Ann Butler had uh, uh, done research on Jack Hart. And yes. so the Hart connection there uh was one of the draws for me but also um in that collection it made me realize or in, in at liberty hall it made me realize that there was a connection with the waterways of kentucky and how that yes. we were um boat people steamboat captains and steamboat uh, uh workers and which uh, gave us more mobility and it explains part of our uh, migration patterns. So mm -hmm. that was part of that. So if you get a chance to go visit there, you need to, and mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that for right now. <laughs> That's great. Um, so but, I do hear, oh, go ahead. Did somebody have no, I just want to add too that just Liberty Hall itself and its connection to Missouri and the children who settled in Missouri and their role in anti-slavery and underground railroad movement in Missouri, uh, as well as Brown's uh, mother, the Wycliffs, you know, mm -hmm. they were right there in Trimble County and their role. And so yes. that Preston Wycliffe Brown connection 
Uh, if you want to know how to research Black history, it always starts with these connections. And so the slaves at the uh, Liberty Hall just, and I'll talk about this a little more when, we, when I get a chance, but the idea of how you trace people, the word slave can sometimes make you think a certain way about a person without revealing the totality of the person. So when we talk about someone being enslaved by the Brown family, that has absolutely nothing to do with how they functioned in terms of black society. So I, I, everyone should keep that in mind because when you're in that house, you know a lot. And it's not like you're keeping that information to yourself as much as we like to think that slaves were deaf, dumb and blind, that's not the case. They had their own society and network of people and family members that had been migrating all over the country. And this is the basis of how they were generating freedom for others. And I'll stop right there. I would love to pick up on that. Um, Alistine, I have a letter. Could I do a screen share by any chance, Sherry? Let me see. I'm going to give you, um, give you more power. Let's see. Hang on. Because Let's one of the sure. most incredible pieces of evidence in the research that I did, did ongoing, um, I, you know, I wrote the song about Dolly, but I, and I released the album, but I keep researching the Hart family. So um, one of the most incredible pieces of research was a letter from Robert Brown, 1854, who uh, used to live at Liberty Hall Estate, uh, presumably was enslaved there. He was writing to another woman who was still enslaved there named Millie it's from 1854. And she, um, was sort of receiving his letter within which was a message to, to the community that lived there, but also to Orlando Brown, the property owner. Um, at the very end of the letter, he actually, after saying how everyone's doing, uh, Frederick and Henry Hart are doing well, he's sort of making small talk in a way, reporting how well people are doing in Chatham, Canada, which is a destination for many people that were uh, on the railroad. Um, at the end of the article, Robert, at the end of the letter, Robert uh, makes an offer to Orlando Brown for his own wife and children for $750. So it was a business letter. It was a um, probably something that he had done before for other people or other people had done with the, with the Brown family. Uh, we know that Frederick, uh, not only was manumitted, but then paid um, off the manumission debt for his wife and children also. It's a pretty complicated story there with the Browns for many generations. But, um, you know, essentially the, that estate, Liberty Hall and the Orlando Brown House were systematically manumitting a lot of the people that did live there or had been born there. Um, I was going to share that letter because it is always, I think, um, you know, very moving and compelling to be able to see um, the handwriting, to see the real, you know, uh, the real item. Um, I'm gonna, I'll have to close my chat here, get this bigger, but you can see, it, how's that look? Yeah. Um, so here's the top, and this is provided to me by Philston Historical Society, but I want to add, Sherry, that the way I found this letter uh, was a was a Google search. I just put in Frederick and Henry Hart, I believe. And, you know, I, I looked many, many pages deep into that search, but I found this letter because their names were together in this letter and it was a digitized translation on the Kentucky Historical Society website. That's how I found the initial content wow. of the letter. And then I went to, his, to, to Filson to get this copy. So as you see this beautiful letter, not only seems to, well, it was a key piece of evidence for my research because it really did connect in a, in a familial way with Frederick and Henry Hart with people who had lived at Liberty Hall. Um, but it's also just an incredible uh, layered story here of people who had clearly um, gotten their freedom and moved not only north, but out of the country. As, as I understand it, Chatham, Canada was often a destination for people from this part of the country. It was a very uh, booming town at that time. Right. So down uh, here, 
so did Rachel, uh, Chatham County was really settled by um, Kentucky African Americans initially, and it was set up to assist the slaves' escapes into Canada. So um, you have people like Henry Bibb and uh, yeah. many others. I used to do tours there on a regular basis, but I haven't done that in a while. But it's a wonderful place, and it has definite Kentucky, over 600 Kentucky connections. Wow. So well, this letter is one of them. And, you know, Sharon and I were talking one day about the, if you look at a map and you think about, and especially the waterways point that Sharon made, you think about, um, you know, Frederick Hart was born at Boonesboro and worked there, went north on the Kentucky River to Frankfurt, lived and worked there. When he got his freedom, he went north from there over the Ohio River and into sort of southwestern uh, Cleveland area, Elyria, Ohio. Um, it has made me wonder many times if he actually thought about going to Chatham, Canada, which it really, when you look at a map, again, would be just a diagonal straight line across from Cleveland. So when you look at the map, you see that, that migration pattern and you know why a lot of people from Kentucky must have wound up there. So anyway, thanks for letting me share that. That's a has been one of the um, more exciting discoveries in my multi-year journey. That's wonderful. In fact, a you beautiful know, piece of evidence. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Uh, my next question was kind of trying to um, kind of piggyback on on what uh, Rachel was talking about as far as the research that was that was behind the film and everything, and and wanting you guys to kind of elaborate if you, if you can think of any other examples in your research that you've been you've um, encountered this time period, but honestly, Dr. Turley kind of started into, a, 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 I think, a direction that we do want to go as far as, you know, identity, and, and um, one of my questions was about misconceptions, and, you know, how that can, sometimes that can, that can definitely hinder our research, um, you know, how we overcome those misconceptions to kind of broaden that mindset so that our methodology doesn't, um, doesn't hamper us right out of the gate. So feel free to dig into that. <laughs> well, I have to say that, thank you, uh, uh, Sherry, for that introduction and Rachel for your great work and showing actual proof of what can happen when you just do a little digging. And so in many cases, we've been given a concept of African-Americans because we do use the word enslaved, which is a reality. African-Americans were enslaved. However, in the state of Kentucky, there were certain things that African-Americans were permitted to do that were not permitted in many other slaveholding states. Number one, a slaveholder had great uh, liberty as to how they treated their slaves. So in other words, if I was a slave owner and I wanted to educate my slave, if I wanted to give my slave property, if I wanted to allow them travels and privileges, I was free to do that. By 1850s, that starts to change because Kentucky is getting pressure from others um, to kind of control African-Americans a little better. But there was a huge window of opportunity in there when African-Americans could do quite a bit. So by the time the Civil War ends, Kentucky has the largest number of educated, formerly enslaved people in the country. So we're sending teachers and African-Americans all over the nation to help other African-Americans sort of get up to the level of education and literacy that slaves in Kentucky had experienced. That's number one. And I think that's key. So when you talk about um, looking for African-American history, you always have to start with the people who own slaves. You know, Kentucky had a countable number about a hundred or so, I think, that had large numbers of enslaved African-Americans. So most Kentuckians did not own slaves. You know, if they did, they owned one or two because slaves are expensive. And so generally, if you know something about the history of rich Kentucky families, that is a great, that's where I started documenting my own family history um, and the connections to known Kentucky families, the Clay family, the uh, uh, Turley family, which is where I get my name. And so doing all of that 
points you in directions, you got to look at their records. You got to look at those family records to find out where they came from, who they brought with them to Kentucky, uh, where the family migrated to, because generally they're taking African-Americans with them wherever they're going, which is how we end up in various locations. But it also means that we have connections back home. So even though I've left Kentucky, uh, I still have family in Kentucky. I still know what's going on in Kentucky. I know who has made their way to Canada. I can read letters from them. I know what is important to my owner. I understand what his interests are. So I am working on the river, promoting his products, running his businesses. I'm doing all those things. I'm making clothes. I'm independent of him, but yet dependent on him. Because in Kentucky, what does it mean to be a free person if you are not endorsed and protected by your white owner? There's really nothing you can do to me as long as my owner has my back because that's how Liberty Kentucky laws were set up. So that can be both good and bad. But I think also that's important to understand when you're comparing slavery in Kentucky to slavery somewhere else like Mississippi or Florida or Texas. So for enslaved African-Americans, that was often a control mechanism the threat of being sold away from Kentucky, which is of course where my old Kentucky home, that whole song idea comes from, is that you know when you're being sold away from Kentucky that you're gonna lose a lot of these privileges. Once you get sold to Florida or Louisiana or Texas, your life expectancy was roughly seven years. You know, slaves in Kentucky lived a lot longer but when you get sold into cotton or sugar cane production, your lifespan is literally seven years was max. And that was considered a long time. So I don't know how much more you want me to expand on it, but I, I definitely think the idea of trying to research African-American history without researching white history is almost impossible. You can't do it. You know, you really do have to look at families who own slaves. And because there are a lot of meticulous records uh, that were kept, just like uh, Rachel has pointed out, of these relationships that are ongoing, even after the Civil War. So, I mean, researching, and a lot of families don't want to deal with that topic. A lot of white families don't want to get into the ownership of people. I understand that. But unfortunately for me, unless I know about your history, I can't really fully research mine. So I, right now I have Turley family members I've been trying to get an interview with and they won't talk to me because they have their own anxieties about admitting at one point they own slaves. So I want them to get past that because I would like to know more about my ancestor connected to their family. There's probably a lot more they can tell me. Wow, yes, that's wonderful. Goodness, um, any other, any other uh, feedback? You, any panelists wanna jump in on, on some of this? <laughs> Opening the floor, y'all. <laughs> well, I wanna reiterate that. I feel like this is a critical moment for genealogy and research. If, if white families that have these kinds of records and these stories and chapters aren't willing to both come to grips with it and, and research it themselves, but share it, we aren't gonna get much further down this very windy road. And I, and I, I really think it is important to emphasize what Alstine just pointed out, which is that the white families often have very meticulous letter, uh, uh, records and letters and um, bills of sale and wills and deeds and all kinds of paperwork, um, some of which you know isn't in the courthouse, isn't online. Um, and so the, the records that private families hold are key to helping to bring these stories to the surface for other family members 
And, um, you know, it really, it really should be a communal effort. But as Alstein points out, people are, they're anxious, they don't want to get into this. It's, it's a, it is a, um, you know, like I said earlier on, it's a big pond to get into genealogy and research in your own family. And um, I think people have a little bit of terror about that because they don't know what all they're going to learn. And maybe they don't want to learn uh, some uncomfortable truths. Oh, they don't want to discover family members either that might be replaced, <laughs> you know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, you know, because that's kind of a Kentucky thing, especially before 1830. There's a great deal of mixed race. Um, yes. One of the biggest industries that Kentucky had was selling mixed race women to the Louisiana market. Mm -hmm. And they were extremely expensive because they were so beautiful. And they were refined, but they were also mixed race women who roughly you would spend $3,500 for to purchase. Mm -hmm. So there's, I'm sure there are lots of things that people don't want to know, but unfortunately that's what history is. History is things that have happened. So we would like to know right. more about what has happened, especially to the women who were sold to New Orleans slave market as fancy women um, from Kentucky, which is kind of what Kentucky, when we hear beautiful women, bourbon and horses, the beautiful women are referring to a lot of them, a lot of women who were sold for a price to the New Orleans slave market. <clears throat> and they fetched a high price and people would come from all over the country to buy them. So that, that is another one of those areas that can be painful for people to explore. Yeah. Um, just one little um, thing. I'd like, oh. oh, sorry. I'll let you just, um, Sharon has had to step away. She's had a, a family emergency. So hopefully she'll be oh, able no. to join us in just a minute. So, um, but anyway, yes, go right ahead. Please. Yeah, I'd like to, to chime in. And um, I'm in total agreement with Alistine and Rachel that um, we, actually share the same stories. Our, our stories are your stories. And um, the most effective way to, to discover what we want to discover, to discover our history, is to study the stories of, of all of our families. Uh, because we, I would not have probably 70% of my family history uh, document it if I had not learned to go to the stories of the, the white enslavers or their associates and family members, um, because that's where it begins. You know, when we, um, before emancipation, Black people were not named by name. They were certainly not documented in um, your standard historical records and to find them listed by name before or during the antebellum period, we have to go to the court records, the deeds, the probate records, letters, uh, those kinds of records regarding the enslaver because that's where we'll find, or hopefully that's where we'll find their given names or a hint of their given name so that we can move it forward into, uh, into history. Well, I would, I would love to add that um, in all of the research I did on Dolly, one of the ways that I, you know, with any piece of evidence that you find, you probably want to find one or two others that support <laughs> that piece. And um, a lot of the supporting evidence that I found was in my ancestors' wills and deeds. And so um, Elizabeth Calloway, the white woman that I had initially started researching, her son, William Hoy, was an early settler and had a station outside of Boonesboro. And um, he was killed in a Shawnee raid and in 1789 or 90. And his will lists Dolly in particular almost singling her out. And I think it's because Dolly had been with Elizabeth and Elizabeth's children. So he made a special, um, you know, request that she be uh, treated differently than the rest of his slaves. 
um, who were listed in an inventory list along with all of the equipment and the animals and you know all of the farm holdings, which is something um, very hard to read. And uh, I included a little bit of that list in one of the songs, End of Dominion, that you saw in the film. I'm just pointing out this is another, I mean, there's just so much that I drew from to make the musical and film work. But um, that piece of evidence was also just something so um, concrete and, and difficult to look at and to read, but it was also a really critical piece of evidence. So just reiterating what you said. <laughs> um, I'd like to share a part of my research. Um, all of my paternal family uh, began their lives enslaved. Uh, some were manumitted, but as far as I can tell, everyone was enslaved, probably in uh, Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina, and then they migrated to uh, the Western Kentucky area. And I was in trying to prepare what I was would talk about today. I tried to think about the records that date back. Uh, back into the 18th century, as far back as I could go. And I, I actually have a 1786 will of the father of one of my family's enslavers, actually naming my ancestor by name. So that's the earliest time that he was named. And I, he was maybe about, oh, 10 to 15 years of age, and he was named with a female. Um, his name was David. He was named with a female, Millie. And I don't know yet if she was an older sister or if she was possibly his mother. And all of this actually started in my research journey when I was researching Ohio court equity cases. There were some there was some controversy over uh, my Porter family and someone's, someone's property. Um, and in reading the, the equity case, I actually determined that the original enslaver of my family, his surname was Taylor. His name was James Taylor. And here all along, we were thinking we were Porters. <laughs> um, and this was about 1880. So once I found the name of the enslaver, James Taylor, I started researching him. And I started with, I knew his family was from Virginia. I started with his federal census records moving back and his slave schedules. And he migrated to Ohio County, Kentucky uh, in the early 1800s. So by going back that far, I was able to identify his father, Simon Taylor, and that was the man whose uh, will was recorded in 1786. So from there, I was able to move forward and uh, identify David Taylor. And he was actually, he and his wife were actually manumitted in 1829 by James Taylor who was preparing to migrate to Southern Illinois. The, um, there was just a, there was a kink in the story though, at least, at least as far as I was concerned. David and Mary Taylor were manumitted in 1829. One of their oldest sons was manumitted by the son of James Taylor in 1831, I believe. And then a second one was manumitted when he became uh, 35 years of age. So that would have been about 1855. There were several other siblings, Taylor siblings, one of whom was my second great grandfather and they were sold. These were the younger uh, siblings. So from what I know of American history, um, I concluded that they were sold for economic reasons. Um, there was, there, I guess there was, you know, there was no 
reason for James Taylor to manumit them for economic reasons. And then secondly, there was an issue of manumitting uh, several young, uh, formerly enslaved people and worrying about, well, who is, is Kentucky gonna have to take the burden of taking care of these people because, you know, are they, are they trained? Can they support themselves? Is there anyone to su help support them? Um, so I think those were probably two of the primary reasons that the younger siblings were, were sold and they were sold to um, a Porter family in Ohio County and Butler County. Uh, so that's an example of how, even though I started out uh, in post-emancipation records, uh, I, I was given clues to go back and try to trace the, the steps of my older enslaved ancestors and, and bring that forward. Denise, you and I definitely need to talk. Uh, so I want to make sure after this is over, because not to promote, but my book is coming out and I do talk about James Taylor and his selling of the slaves into Illinois. Oh. But actually, his son, his son is the one who uh, manumitted the slaves because James Taylor was an evangel evangelical. So we have a lot to talk about, and maybe you can fill in some spots. I know about him leaving and selling, mm -hmm. uh, and some key operatives came out of that. This is another example of how the laws affect whether or not you manumit someone, because it sounds great. You know, I'm going to manumit my slave. But what does that mean in a slaveholding state? Kentucky law says you couldn't stay here more than a year once you were manumitted. So where do you go? And so in many cases, people would choose to um, keep their slave just to protect them legally, because once they're freed, they have no legal protections whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so that is another one of those areas where you have to examine this whole idea of manumission and what it means. You can't be manumitted. Believe it or not, a lot of manumitted slaves stayed in Kentucky, but just as many left. Mm -hmm. And this is how they end up in places like Chatham or um, Illinois or other places. But to be manumitted in a slaveholding state is dangerous work. So it's right. not something uh, you can do lightly. And normally when you manumit, you're responsible for setting a $500 bond for that manumitted slave. Yes. So if you don't have the money to post a bond for these people that you're freeing, you just can't do it. I mean, it costs a lot of money for the slave owner to do it. So I think an area of research has to do with how did that slave owner utilize his enslaved people? Mm -hmm. and have, that, that that's a big question yeah i have a question on james this james taylor uh what area are is he associated with region and what occupation uh he, well he was a farmer he migrated from uh hampshire county at the time it was hampshire county virginia and now it's west virginia he migrated from there in the early 1800s to Ohio County, Kentucky. And there was, but there was a huge Taylor family in the Ohio County area who had migrated from different parts of Virginia. And when James manumitted David and Mary, um, he, if in effect, put them under the uh, guardianship, if you will, of one of his cousins, uh, Septimus Taylor. And they remained on the land that they had worked with, with their entire family. Um, one son was manumitted and moved back to Illinois. And then the other one wasn't manumitted until 1855. And he stayed in the Ohio County area. I think Septimus wrote an actual history, uh, Denise. Septimus I think Taylor he, he did, yeah. yeah. Wrote a history, and it's really part of the uh, Illinois Historical Society. 
So you might want to really look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, see, he, it's, they try to document those early Turley, uh, Taylor connections outside <laughs> of Kentucky. I think they had some time in Northern Kentucky, Boone County too. There I were, think they may have, yeah. There were some that, yeah, were in the Boone County area, I believe. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, Dr. Turley, please don't tease us like that. You can tell us what your book is, <laughs> when it's coming out, and how we can get a copy. <laughs> it, the book is coming out, UK Press, um, August of next year. And really what I tried to do, it's called, um, oh God, they, re they, they changed the title. So I'm just, I'm trying to get used to the name, but it's, um, the original title was Black Evangelicals and the Gospel of Freedom. Uh, so it's talking about the evangelical structure of the Underground Railroad, which my thesis is I've never liked the idea of the North claiming an Underground Railroad. So the South is where an Underground Railroad really was happening. But it, it didn't get written about because it was Black people operating it. When you see it in Ohio and other places, that's because white folks had the ability to write about it and talk about it. Black folks didn't. So if you, you really didn't want anybody writing or talking about Underground Railroad in the South, that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Right. And so the book explores those connections. Taylor family is a part of it. Those connections, Underground Railroad connections from Kentucky and other places South that if you look at the map, there's a map in the book and you'll see the routes there were actually about 13 routes that covered the entire state of Kentucky, which were feeding people from lower south to north and into Canada. Wow. So that's what the book is about. Sounds amazing. We can't wait. <laughs> One of the reasons that I ask is that in exploring a rare books collection uh, a couple of weeks ago, I came across the James Taylor and I want to say 1820s, 1830s. Uh, a book, and he was, uh, what we noticed was the book was published in, in Versailles, Kentucky. And we didn't, we wondered why, or didn't know that Versailles had a publishing company. And we found out that he was a, um, he was a doctor, and the book was about medicines, uh, which would, which brought on with me was he associated with the James Taylor liquor, the, you know, um, the company and whatever that's round, right around Frankfurt, uh, Brussels and, and Midway. So that's why I was asking if about his region and his occupation, mm -hmm. which to me brings another thing that we need to look for, especially with, um, the professionals like doctors that they often kept what they call day books. And those day books were rich in, in, uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of the estates and of, of the, the medical practices of the farms and, and whatever. And a lot of times you will find that uh, the blacks would had, had semi-professional uh, positions like they were the midwives and the um, they were the horse trainers. There, there were other things that went on in those day books. So anytime you can locate one of the day books, the first one that I actually saw was at the Scott County Library. And, was, and in that actually uh, saw the day-to-day -day operations, including how the, the medicines were dispensed by the, uh, by the black midwife and what her journeys and whatever were that were associated with my husband's family. So this is just a resource thing that, that you all's conversation then brought to mind. Mm -hmm. Well, also <laughs> keep in mind in Kentucky, Transylvania University records, doctor's records, because they had the school, the, the region's first medical school, you'll find that there's a slave dealer who specialized in selling 13-year-old boys. And a lot of them were used uh, medically, you know, in terms of surgeries and 
So there's a whole underside of this that, you know, it would be difficult even for me to write about. So I have stacks of records, which I which it's just hard to even go through because uh, women, when you talk about gynecological examinations and how that whole practice developed, it's generally black women who are the ones upon which these um, examinations are being done and medical discoveries are being made. Um, which is how you end up training Black nurses because Black women had to take care of other Black women who've had procedures done in order to try new equipment and all of this. So there's a whole medical um, history that could be written about how we developed a lot of the practice that we're acquainted with. So I'm just saying, you're only scratching the surface. Once again, if you wanna know Black history, Connect it to white history and everything that's being developed and, and explored and understood about humans is first being tried out on slaves because we're expendable. So I don't know of a delicate way to put that, but if you're going to look at slavery, that's what you're looking at. Connected to that, um, I, I recall that in the Liberty Hall records, and in Preston Brown's papers were, um, I think you use the term the day, day logs or day sheets um, from the Brown family uh, regarding Frederick because it, it appears that Preston Brown was renting Frederick to a farm in Bourbon County and he had um, a medical checkup or some procedure done either before or after, it was really more of just a checkup, I think. But that was, you know, that was detailed in a log. So, um, you know, as far as records, that's another thing you wouldn't ever think about. But um, again, these prosperous white families kept those kinds of records. So um, it's just one more place you can find a, a name or a mention of someone's whereabouts or maybe where they were going. Um, so uh, that's another thing to look for. Well, I don't really have any more questions, y'all. We talked about uh, <laughs> we talked about misconceptions and I know you guys gave, gave some great examples already getting back into the 18th century with a lot of your research and everything. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think that is a just mentally while you guys were talking, I was thinking about um, all of the different places. It is really remarkable how it's the little clues that you find and these side records that you just, if you go down that path, you find stuff and, and you just, it's, it's almost, I don't want to say it's hard to explain, but it's almost hard to explain the path that you take to get to some of the information. Um, for some of my family, there was, um, um, there was an enslaved family that was owned by, um, one of my great, like a third great grand, no fifth great grandfather who was a revolutionary soldier. So he was a veteran. Um, I was, he, he manumitted them and then gave his property to um, the mother of the children that were there. The children were presented and described as yellow. So I'm assuming they were his children. Um, later in some research, I actually believe it was his son who was the father but it, it had to do with the relationships that I was seeing between the two of them and these weird little family stories that were in different branches of the family. And I was, I was sensing there's something going on here between the two of them. Then I started looking at what I didn't see. And so I was seeing that, okay, he, uh, he owned them as apparently to, to manumit them at that point, but then, gee, he's not paying taxes during these years on them, but he's paying taxes right here. But then when I looked at his son, it turns out they were taking turns, swapping, paying the taxes on them. So I'm seeing more of a relationship. And it's just, it's amazing to me now as I look back, all these different side little records and side ways that I get there. And yeah, I think that's just, you know, mentally opening that up and saying, you can't always just take that, that direct path. You've got to really expand it. Thank you, Sherry. That is the best way to put it. There is no direct path. It's more like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> but if you, if you start with one family, inevitably, you're going to find what you're looking for. And it's just a case of, do you know what you're looking for when you see it? Because 
when families are manumitted, Kentucky didn't always list them by color. Right. You know, Kentucky has a very odd way and it goes from county to county as to how you get identified in the public record. You know, sometimes they just say free man or uh, mulatto or, you know, they have other ways. And so you even have to figure out the code for your particular county on how they were identifying free people of color. So it's different from region to region. Yes, I recently just did discover my fifth great grandmother was a free woman of color in about 1807 Kentucky. And um, it, it wasn't until I, she was not recorded that way. She married, a, she married a white man. She was not recorded that way, but her brother was, who was the one who was signing her bond. And then all of her children passed as white. However, he also, her brother also married a white woman in, in, in the sense that she's being listed as a white woman initially then he is a black man and then all of the children are black. But then as that, as those years progress, everyone in the family starts drifting and starts passing for white. So it's really, I mean, and just even understanding the legalities of what that was like that early, you know, what right. could they do? What couldn't they do? And well, there's still a brick wall for me because I don't know where they came from <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. um, you know, seeing how did those laws change for them over the years? and seeing that that, I know that's affecting how they are being recorded in the documents. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. glad you Sherry, said, oh. Go ahead, Denise. Um, Sherry brings up a good point. Um, first of all, in terms of when you, when you find the records, um, you just don't read through them once. You, you actually, you learn to live with the records uh, and go back to them and pick them apart and then try to uh, correlate them to the overall history of the time. And that's how we, um, as Alice Dean says, that's how we, we solve that jigsaw puzzle uh, by understanding not only what's going on in the document, but what was, what was going on in the, the uh, social environment of the times. One of the things that I've started to do recently is to go back and pick up the Revolutionary War soldiers. Uh, and if you think about it, they, they were the ones that got the land grants that uh, determined where they're gonna end up owning property. Those property owners are the ones that are more than likely gonna be the ones that own the slaves. But they are also the ones that are better documented because of the DAR and the SAR, where they've tried to trace their, their lineages. And so what we need, what I'm thinking is that sometimes we need to start picking up those descendants, those, those Revolutionary War, and look at their wills and uh, look at the locations where they are. And if it's close to where you know your family is, then you need to start looking at those soldiers and, and, and seeing, uh, documenting their subs, their, their children and whatever, because there's gonna be wills and, and diaries and journals that are associated there that, that don't necessarily come out as published works. Right. Preach, preach it, because let me tell you, that is actually one of the directions that broke through that case um, of the of the enslaved family that that um, uh, one of my ancestors admitted, because it turns out my branch of the family never received this story. We literally they lived in the neighbor, neighboring county. We had no idea that there was an enslaved family involved in, in our branches and um let alone cousins, you know, I mean, that this, these are, this is a whole other branch of the family. And that just never, that, that ancestor, I was descended from a daughter. And so she died fairly young. Then, then, you know, then her husband married again a couple of times. So the story was literally never passed down into my branch. It was through a DAR supplemental application that I found a narrative from one of the other children who had passed down this story. Now the story was completely perverted. It was all about the, you know, Oh, the the large plantation in Kentucky, and um, these these two and well, they didn't use obviously the word enslaved, but these two enslaved ind individuals loved the owner so much that they stayed around after they were manumitted um, because they were they were faithful to them. It was completely wrong. Um, you know, 
he owned this this woman and had fathered children off of her. That is why they were connected. And so it, it, it was a completely perverse story. However, it helped me connect back to and gave me clues to research in order to get to the real story. Uh, so again, not only the application, but the supplemental documents had letters from those collateral lines that actually helped me get to that story. It was right. crazy. <laughs> it was, and Sharon, it was Revolutionary War records or, or land grants that allowed me to find James Turley, who is where my Turley name comes from. And his move from Virginia to Kentucky with his 11 children and, uh, <laughs> And how, who owned slaves? So, so being able to find my great grandfather came through those records, being able to find out James Turley's move from Virginia to Kentucky, and then his son's move from, and his move from Kentucky to Illinois. And, and how he uh, worked with the Indian records because he was an Indian negotiator here in Kentucky. And so there, there were, there's, tons of things on James Taylor or James Turley. I keep saying Taylor, Denise, you got that in my head now, but uh, James Turley and his role in Kentucky and what caused him to leave Kentucky because it was a slaveholding state. And I suspect he had some mixed race children. When he left, he left property to his, one of his formerly enslaved women. So yeah, those are, all the records are, are mixed up in there but you can find the thread if you're willing to follow it. I will just mention there's been a couple of questions here on um, military records. Obviously we, we just uh, dove right into some revolutionary. I think um, land records, obviously land grants, all of those, those are really great to try to track down that uh, portion of military. Obviously too, you know, pension applications for revolutionary soldiers. I know we'd also mentioned the DAR applications because there's so many, the lineage that goes back to because once you get to one of those, then track down where they were living and take a look at those probate records and see who may be named in the estate settlements or the wills or whatever. So that's one way to be tracking those down. Um, but then we've had some other questions about anybody working with, um, uh, wait, what did it say? Um, members of the United States colored troops, anybody having um, experience with that? And I know Denise tried to uh, type some in. I know Denise actually has got some information in the handout actually about that. So if you guys wanna jump in a little bit with that, that's. Well, actually, about the um, United States Colored Troops records is that oftentimes that's a good place to find out the name of the enslaver of the enlisted person because it's listed in within their compiled military service record many times, at least on one or two uh, documents towards the end of the file. So if you don't know the enslaver's name before then, and you, you know that your ancestor enlisted in the USCT, then I would recommend that you, you um, search the compiled military service record for them. Not to mention there's the pension records for the USCTs are a wonderful source of information about their life, you know, where they're living, what they're doing, um, how they ended up to be in the community they're in, who they associate with, because a lot of the times there'll be endorsement letters from um, uh, white members of the community who know them. So you can sort of build a network around that USCT based upon just pension records and what letters are in there to, to demonstrate this person is who he says he is. Because you have a lot of African-Americans, once they join the United States Color Troops, they changed their name. They took the name of people they admired uh, or someone they knew had been a free man or woman. So yeah, the records are very helpful. Oh yeah, yeah. And the pension, There's, because the pension records required them essentially to build their own biography to prove who they were, or if it was a widow's pension file, to prove her connection to the soldier. And I just actually ran across one uh, soldier who enlisted under the surname of his enslaver and everything beyond, beginning with his pension card, everything beyond the Civil War, he had gone back to what looked like was a, a uh, family surname. 
and and lived that way, lived under that name throughout his life. So, I do have a question, or actually a couple questions. It said um, that from Karen, the records mentioned um, we mentioned family papers, wills, and deeds, which sounds pretty traditional to researching enslaved people. What lesser known records did you use for these early settlers? Many enslavers migrated with Kentucky to enslave uh, with enslaved people before it was a state. What records are used to find them? Well, that's where I would go back to. Uh, number one, you need to know the county formation. And a lot of people don't realize that, that Kentucky was Kentucky County, Virginia. And so you not only have to look at, look at the ages that we're talking about, because if you look at an 18, I'm just going to say an 1870 census and the person is 80 years old, there's a very good chance that somebody in that family is going to say they were born in Virginia. Now, were they, were they really born in Virginia or was it already Kentucky? I mean, was it Kentucky? Um, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so that's where I'm looking at with those, uh, those early records. Um, one of the other things is your beers, it was your early maps. Uh, like uh, I used the 1876 uh, beers map for a springboard because if your family is in a certain area, then look at those landowners there. And incidentally, all of them on that map may not be white because I did find a, uh, uh, one of my great great grandfathers on that map as owning land. How where how did he get the land? So the deed rooms, the maps are just as critical. And don't forget the county lines, uh, they changed. So one of the one of the resources there should be from your from family search. Uh, I think, and it gives you a movable timeline on uh, uh, on the formation of the counties. So just because you're in Madison County doesn't mean you shouldn't go back and look at the Lincoln County records or the Fayette County records. So and one thing, um, and I know uh, Rachel also mentioned it as well, but um, I don't think I can emphasize enough for 18th century history um, are the, is the Draper collection, um, simply because I, I did an experiment with mine. I mean, I, you know, I can't attest, I really can't, I don't, I have not studied this, but I cannot attest to how many um, enslaved individuals may be named or, or you know, even um, free people of color may be named in there. Um, I did an example, in fact, the, the, little, the little paragraph image that you see in the handout, um, that was one that actually surprised me because I had a family story that said that um, one of my groups came down on a flatboat down the Ohio and that it was two rumors. One said that this ancestor was was killed um, by the Indians and the other one was said, oh no, his son saved him from being so. So I was just searching for that general surname to see what happened. And I came across three different accounts of the same story. And one of them include, included um, a person of color. Now they don't say he was enslaved. It says he was with someone. So I'm assuming that he was. Um, but he was actually named in that. And that's something when you talk about early, like early Kentucky history and just even the settlement period, so many things were written and repeated in different publications like the Register of the Historical Society and other early publications. And of course, we know those have been greatly filtered before they were published, um, you know, for, for white readers. Um, but when we look at that, where did they get these accounts of the experiences on on what they you know, viewed as a frontier. What, where did those experiences come from? A lot of those experiences came from like the Draper manuscripts because they were interviews done by, yes, it was maybe a generation or two past when it actually happened, but sometimes they were people that actually lived during that time. And I know they're a messy, it's a messy microphone collection to use, but honestly, it's, it's really, really worth it to look into those families to kind of get some sense of their migration, and um, to, to then pinpoint back down to, as, as Sharon was talking back to the, to the counties you need uh, to then start digging into the right record set to track them down. And then Sharon, could you also talk about church records and minutes? That's another um, source that people don't think of for very early Kentucky period. 
the way I got into the church records, um, if you look at Boonesboro and you realize, and you look at the history of Boonesboro and you realize, okay, that was only a small acreage. So people went out in uh, spokes away from uh, Boonesboro in order to obtain land. Well, some of those spokes end up like in at Bryan Station, the Bryan Station in Lexington or the uh, Stamping Ground and Great Crossing. I found church minute books uh, also included um, the old Providence uh, Church, uh, Howard's Creek in, in Clark County. Those old church records actually they had black members. They, they voted them in, they voted them out, but they recorded those members. Uh, in Clark County, I found one of my greats as he was, she was John George's. John George was one of the uh, early uh, Boonesboro people. And she was listed as John George's Dosha. Well, my family from Richards had gone back to, uh, uh, I lost them, 1840s or so. I totally lost them. And someone said to me, said, well, you know that John George, he, he was murdered and his wife remarried a Richards. And when you look at the family names, that's what, that's what I was, how I was able to go step a, uh, a piece back. But then I looked at the church records right where my grandfather was actually born uh, and, and, and buried. Uh, and here are the church records that mention my family names uh, in those church records. So just because they are white church records don't mean, doesn't mean that you don't have black family records in there. The one over at uh, Stamping Ground uh, actually says, and this is just an example, uh, and it says that, you know, John Doe and the slaves of John Doe, and she joined the church and, you know, she associated with the church by baptism on a certain date, and and it, and it keeps the record. You know, they, they were born, they died, uh, might be their children. So that's uh, really important is those church records. And can you speak a little bit about availability of church records? I mean, where have you found them? I mean, we have a we have a small amount. A lot of people come to us thinking we have a lot, and we just don't. Um, as far as what survives, where you're finding them. Hmm. Um. I, I found quite a few by looking at in the Fayette County, uh, uh, Lexington Public Library. Okay. Um. Good. Uh, the Kentucky History Center. <laughs> Yeah, we have some. <laughs> so, uh, look at your your local. Uh, sometimes we ignore our local libraries right. and mm -hmm. our local historical societies mm -hmm. because they have records sometimes that are not published to the point of being on WorldCat. So they're self published or or uh, local publications. So check those local places also. Um, I would I, say. Um, I found church records for Old Lobel Grud um, in Clark County on uh, Family Search. Um, somebody had just typed it up and put it on Family Search as a PDF. And so it was online. Rachel, that's where I live on Lobel Grud Creek, where uh, <laughs> David Barrow began his anti slavery church. So um, all of that, I live very near where David Barrow is, is buried. So. Wow. And I found those early church records just by going. I started out at Clark County Public Library. Mm -hmm. And they were just on the floor, not in any particular. Um, people don't know the importance of them. So unless you're going in saying these are important, because a lot of times people have church records, they don't know what to do with them. And so I'm always happy when folks don't destroy them, which often happens. You know, you have a church secretary that secretary dies, they have no idea that these records are very important and they end up who knows where. So uh, many people have them in their personal collections. So if you know a member of a church who's had a been, the family's been there a long time, 
many times people have those personal church records in their personal collections. They don't know that that's something that should be handed over to the historical society or a library, even if it's a local library. I mean, it's, it's better than just destroying them because you're right, it's a gold mine. Yes, and, yes, yeah. be on the lookout for them. So yes, try to point people to, if they've got a stash to donate to someone that can preserve those. Also, look for look for the uh, like the Tate's Creek Association or the uh, Association of Baptists, the Methodist Church. Go in, just do some Google searching, and 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 see what what you can't find that way. Yeah. Uh, because those Tate's Creek minutes are are oh they're wonderful. And Elkhorn you know, Baptist Association records yep. are awesome. Yep. So Kentucky had about seven or eight different associations and they kept great records. Now where they store them, I have no idea. Maybe because that's... Some of these denominations do have regional archives. So some of the dying churches, the denomination will come back up and, and scoop those up and take them to... Um, we had some early ones. We were missing some for um, when Midway was, uh, was an, the orphan school for girls. And I remember um, because it was denominationally connected at the time, um, we had some missing records, like Midway didn't have them. We actually tracked down the regional archive and, and they were actually moving from Tennessee, like to West Virginia. We found them and they actually did have them. So I was really surprised, but it, it does happen. So, and that's where you got to really do your homework as far as what, do you have the right denomination? And then looking for, they're not usually in our state, they're somewhere else in a region. So track them down. West Virginia has a lot of early Kentucky uh, associational records. Um, Tennessee has some as well when you get down into Southern Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky. So yeah, they may not all be here. There's some interesting things in the chat that has to do with these records also. Yes. Yeah. Antoinette's uh, talking about the University of Kansas as the Nicodemus, Kansas records and the Stamping Ground Church that uh, where those members of Stamping Ground uh, 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 as part of the Exodusters yeah. end up in, in Nicodemus. And the Stamping Ground records, are, those were the very first ones that I saw. Right. And those records were very well kept, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think they were all part of the Elkhorn Baptist Association. And so a lot of those records, you can, it, the minutes are awesome. David Barrow took some great minutes too. His minute book is there. Um, who was that? David Barrow, who oh. was uh, the Lowby Grud Creek Church. They also had a school there for African-Americans on Lowby Grud, which was over there near Howard's Creek. So you know, it's it's just all these little tidbits of information out there. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm. We are running towards the end of our allotted time. I know we could all talk about this for a very long time. Are there any other last minute questions anybody would like to um, to put in the chat? Um, let's see. Actually, I've got a couple of things I'll, I'll read here real quick. Um, uh, Billy has said that they have found an 1872 ledger beginning with the founding 17 members in their church basement, along with ledgers of Sunday school minutes. And um, Judda has said the Boone County Public Library has the records of the first Universalist Church of Burlington founded in early 1870s, which I've used in my research. So yeah, that's, I think that's, that's one of our biggest messages is that it's, there's, there's, you know, it's nooks and crannies, you know, to try to find these different record sets and it takes detective work to find them. And I know that's not what everybody wants to hear. It's, you know, but um, it's worth it. It's really worth it. Any other last, uh, I'm not seeing any questions come through. Any, any other last uh, comments or tidbits from our panelists before we head out? I like to say this is, I'm sorry. This has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I'm with a group from Illinois, Illinois, Iowa border. Um, my ancestors were from, from Glasgow, Glasgow, Glasgow. I don't know how you say it. Um, but anyway, joined uh, the 108th Regiment and guarded prisoners. One of the things they did was, of course, guard prisoners at the Rock Island prison. 
And that's how my family um, made it over here. So we just formed this group so that we could um, learn as much as we could about um, the 980 men of the regiment. We wanted to do research. Um, we uh, One of the things that we are in the process of we're discussing um, having the, um, the um, working with the Rock Island uh, Arsenal Cemetery in uh, creating a monument um, for to honor those men. Um, and so I've, I've been doing, we've been doing personal chats as well uh, to get information on how to actually just start the, the this kind of um, research. Um, at, we attended um, the Zoom when uh, the person from the reckoning uh, was was you know talked about the military, and so then we of course found out that we're in a good position in terms of African Americans and history because they were in the military and we will uh, better access to those. But I think the idea is just to get started. And um, that's kind of been a daunting uh, uh, thing. So we just have to jump in because there are a lot of people who want to join us, but we want to be able to, to um, you know, to help, you know, we want to help one another and to actually do that. We have actually have a, a person who wants to help train young people in the area to help us do the research. So, of course, we have to figure this out. I do have a, and so I want to thank um, Thank everyone for just being so generous. And if you could leave uh, email addresses, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll get stumped and we'll we'll have questions and we'll want to continue. We just want uh, to stay connected with the Gene uh, African American Genealogy Group of Kentucky because this is a wonderful resource for us, all the way in Illinois. Um, <laughs> I, I do have a question is maybe it will sound sound odd. My my ancestor, my great great grandfather um, was a, a, a raced horses is the person who owned him owned these racehorses. And we actually have his his narrative. And he talks about how uh, he um, raced horses around Kentucky and Tennessee until he became you know too big and came back to the plantation to learned other skills. He became a veterinarian. Does anybody, has anybody ever done any research on, on this business of horse racing? And um, I have, I've research I've done with black, blacks and, and jockey being jockeys. It all, it's all, all the information that I've been getting is, is information about, you know, after the civil war ended and those well-known names of black jockeys, but I haven't read any information on slaves as horse jockeys. Well, you know that there's a research beginning now on that. There's a, in fact, I just met with a film uh, director about three weeks ago. They're, they're trying to put together a um, film about early bl blacks and early horse industry. And that's being supported by the um, Kentucky Horse Park and some other areas around the state because people are finding out that this early history goes directly back to slavery. Although we hear Isaac Murphy and a mm -hmm. lot of the other names that you're familiar with, mm -hmm. there are just as many folks who uh, were raising and training horses. And I think this film is supposed to come out in 2023. Oh. It's a specific focus on Kentucky and the horse industry, similar to what you're talking about when it comes to the bourbon industry mm -hmm. and the look at African-American connections to the bourbon industry. So what we're finding out is, is how all these um, family connections are intertwined and are building to this wonderful history that kind of spreads out around the country. So in answer to your question, there's no one collected source. All that information is being put together now and you could be a great help by contributing to that history. And that's what I wanted to close with is that everyone who's doing research on their particular family is building this network we need to be able to, to tie together 
all these loose ends and connect them. I, I guarantee you they are connections. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you add your piece to the puzzle, it just makes the picture that much clearer for everyone else. Like even our panelists had already connected. I mean, Dr. Turley and Denise, you both already connected immediately. Wow. Um, no, I tell you, actually, uh, with the, I love, um, Sharon, Sharon mentioned Keeneland Library. That's also, that is a really great resource as far as um, some records for the racing industry and everything. I did have, and this author would, I'm not going to name him because he probably would kill me if he knew I said this, but one of the things he was researching was um, pre-Civil War, he was trying to look at some of the, um, the slave schedules and he was researching um, those men he knew that were involved in racing horses. And his theory was that if you saw a large group of young boys, enslaved boys, that that was more than likely he was racing the horses. So like he was, he was trying to do some, um, some correlation there um, that he was trying to um, kind of just identify by the groups that were owned, um, if he could pinpoint some of those that were more involved in racing and everything. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a new field. It's not really a new field. It's just that I think it's growing. It's, there's some new, new directions that they're taking it in. Um, there was someone that had their, their hand up, but I think they may have actually. Yes. That person was Michael. Yes. It's Michael. Um, and Shelly, um, there is a group, I put it in the chat called, I cannot remember all the the letters stand for P P A A T H. It's a group of artists and activists based in Louisville, Kentucky. They're devoted to the history of black jockeys in the history of racing. Um, they've commissioned a lot of paintings and um, they continue to do a lot of research on the history of, of African-Americans in horse racing and training. Yes. Uh, I had a question. I put it in chat. Um, in Indiana, because I'm from Indiana, we talk a lot about uh, African-American settlements uh, like Lyle Station, Roberts Settlement. Uh, what are some of the African-American settlements in Kentucky? Uh, well, if you look at every major city like Louisville, Louisville had about eight African-American settlements that ring the city. Lexington had about seven or eight, Caden Town, Ferris Town. I mean, I think if you go online, you probably can find those. But I would just say every major city in this state had Versailles, you know, a few Hunter Town, which is one of the ones that we were talking about before. Every major city had its a ring of African American settlements along its outskirts. So um, it would be too many to name, but I think there are sources, maybe uh, Sherry at the Historical Society or somewhere else, where these uh, settlements are are listed. Um, oh, are these we... these pre antebellum. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I would say too a lot of a lot of local histories per county. So every county, um, you know, could have recorded those in in the histories. Um, I did come across to, I just, this is a little shout out of, to a record set that I, I use, I, I didn't bring it up here because the time frame seems to be way out, but, um, but asking that question reminded me, um, the Barton papers, the E.E. E. Barton papers up, uh, comes out of Pendleton County, and these were interviews done in the 1930s and 40s, uh, all different families that this guy could interview. We have them on microfilm, a lot of other, a lot of other libraries in Kentucky have these on microfilm. But I remember one, I was um, one of my family, it was just a surname, I knew a little pocket, I actually wasn't directly dis directly descended from them, this was a, a collateral line for me, but I remember a notation about this guy's farm along this one road, and the interviewer um, had, or the interviewee had said, um, this, this used to be um, like a freedman's colony here. And yet it was only there for, like they described a very short history that it was there right towards the end of the Civil War. Um, and it quickly vanished. But I'm like, those are little nuggets. Again, we're talking about those nuggets. <laughs> you know, that literally I was like, oh, I, and there's no acknowledgement that I have seen in history books. So sometimes they would come and go. And, and I'm also investigating one, one group because I, uh, the name Yellow, I think is coming up in um, place names for me. That is, um, it's pointing to um, mixed race folks that are settling, free people of color, they're selling in these areas. Um, and especially one that's actually connected with my with my family up in that area. And so 
I'm investigating some of that. So again, keep that open mind. There's so many different layers that, that we can, uh, Marilyn's got her name up by the way. Yes. Thank you. Um, something I wanted to say, I'm a member of Phoenix rising Lex here in Lexington, where we, uh, strive to educate the public, uh, and celebrate African Americans in the horse industry period, not necessarily horse racing, but mostly horse racing from the groom to the jockey, the trainer and all. And we have a lot of information there of, about antebellum um, trainers and um, jockeys and so forth, as well as a most recent, uh, like my father was one. I'm familiar with PATH too in Louisville, but um, I would say that the one here in Lexington is more extensive. We don't celebrate just the jockeys and the trainers that you might hear about. We celebrate the grooms. We celebrate the uh, blacksmiths, uh, we hot walkers, like I was when my father was training and I was young. Um, so th that's a good information source. We have a website. I mentioned it in the chat. Um, so you can look it up and any one of us can um, talk with you or try to help you along that path. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is one question in the chat about um, to Dr. Turley. Where can um, where can we find some Kentucky Underground Railroad maps? Well, <laughs> my book would be one place, but um, <laughs> uh, there really aren't any. You know, we the the few that do exist look at as a region, but hopefully, when when you read the book. My hope, and that's something I was trying to say, it's going to encourage people now when they see names and locations, they can develop their own county map. Because really, the map in my book is just going to show you a broad trail that we know based on escape ads, where people were escaping from, where they were going to. So that's a generalized map. But, but if you know the path, hopefully when you start digging into your own local history, you're gonna be able to put flesh on that map. You're gonna be able to say, well, I know this was, this person helped escape slaves. I mean, there's just so much information we don't have. But if I can give you a general path of, of where people were escaping from and to, uh, and give you some names, maybe you can help us build an, a very comprehensive detailed map about where some of these places were. Just can I piggyback on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that she mentioned, I want to be sure the one ads, the newspapers uh, at the after the Civil War and people are looking for their families and they would sometimes publish uh, uh, a one ad. I'm looking for my mother that was sold down south that to Mississippi in whatever year. Uh, and I haven't heard anything else from her. Um, that type thing. And so that's your newspapers, but also uh, look at your older colored notes because a lot of times you will have who attended the funeral back in 18, 1900, who attended the funeral of 1921, who attended the funeral of this somebody that's now 80 some years old. And it's gonna give you some more clues because it'll talk to you about where these relatives are coming from and, and survivors. So I just wanted to be sure and add the one ads and the colored notes. And the one other thing I wanted to say is don't forget your school, your college records, especially um, Wilberforce, uh, Oberlin, Berea College, those that were educating prior to, or, you know, the, or real close to the Civil War, those student records are going to list their parents in quite a few of the cases. So that's just another resource that, that might be untapped in your, in your. Uh, um, the map I developed for the book used, I had over a thousand escape ads that my students had collected and we charted and that's how we develop those routes. Wow, in fact, that's a question in the chat. 
where newspaper yeah. ads are runaways of value. <laughs> they yeah, are. they are. So yeah. if you, you have, I mean, these slaves were very valuable. So beginning in the 1790s, when I forget when Kentucky gets its first newspaper, but I'm pretty sure it's in the 1790s. You can begin that early, starting to look at who is placing these escape ads, because usually it's going to tell you where the slaves are running from. Often people are running toward other family members or they're running out of state and they have a good sense of where that slave is headed. That's sort of how we develop the map. So, yes, ads are very valuable. And, she, and um, oh, she, collect them, the better. Say that again. For me, you broke up a little bit. Say that last bit again. I was just saying, and the more newspapers you can collect them from, the better. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a little shout out to the Boone County Public Library and their Underground Railroad site um, that they have been doing a really great. I love the idea that it really is taking a county and focusing in on the Underground Railroad, the presence there, the impact there. And that's right. what I think Dr. Turley is really emphasizing for us is that, you know, that location is so, you know, we're talking about, you know, the routes and everything, but boy, look at those, zero in on those individual counties and their involvement. And, you know, sometimes even back, almost, I would say reverse, reverse tracking a little bit. Um, I think it was Indiana, was it? It's not the Indiana Historical Society. There was an Indiana group. It's a government. I can't remember what group. They published some really good Underground Railroad um, publications, and you can actually get them on their site. I'll have to dig them out. Don't ask me all where to get them. But um, literally, they were like selling them for like five dollars or something. We've got. We did go ahead and buy some. We have them here. But what was cool is they were, you know, trotting the the treks through, um, tracking the treks through Indiana. But they were right. pointing, of course, those Kentucky connection right. points, and so. You know, all these different resources, even though it's out of Kentucky, you've got a regional resource there that can help you tie right back. You are actually developing the map. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's how it's done. And Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, all those places have a path through Kentucky. So that would be exciting to have everybody do that. That would be awesome. Yes. yes. Amazing. Um, I know a woman named Yvonne had her hand up, but I, I don't see it now. Is there anybody else? Last call. We went 20 minutes, y'all. <laughs> any any last questions? Yes, I love, honestly, I just last moments while people are trying to save the chat, but I really did. I thought, um, Rachel, when you made that connection between Dolly's Descendants being musical and your, your creative focus on that. I think that was so powerful. I was like, oh, Rachel, this was meant to be. <laughs> you were being led, woman. <laughs> I, that is how it felt at a certain point. And I meant to say that earlier, you know, um, somebody was talking about how you need to read through everything on the document that you're digging up and let it sift through your, your mind and your soul. And it might wake you up one night and you'll realize that there's something really important on there. And you didn't, you didn't realize it the first time you read through it. Yeah. It'll, you know, it'll sink in and you'll realize that is a big clue. <laughs> um, I've had that happen more times than I can count on this project. And, and I know a uh, lot of people have moved so digital these days and keeping digital copies. And I do, I still keep, but honestly, there, there's a collection I have of just my own research. There's paper copies. I'm still going old school and doing some paper copies. And yeah. sometimes I just go back and sit with them with a cup of tea and go back and just go over them. And it's every single time I pull out new information. I just do, yeah. I, you yeah. know, because leave it for a minute and go back to it. You usually find more stuff. Right. Your, intu good way your to intuition it. leaves you there, you know, yeah. to, to make new conclusions or new ideas about where to look for things. Yeah. A good way to, to review those hard copy documents too, is to transcribe them because I have picked up information transcribing. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, very really great. that's a great, yeah. great tip right there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Well, I have some new connections. I know I need to definitely stay in touch with Denise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, man, you guys are in my neighborhood. This is, awesome. <laughs> this is um, a real pleasure. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, this has been a pleasure. Thanks. Yes, thank Thanks, you everybody. For participating. It's been wonderful. And, uh, I think we should call it. It's almost three o'clock, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you.